Well, I'm going to I'm going to start, but I'm going to hand it off to Craig pretty quickly. Uh, basically, what we're showing to you today is a draft, and we're it's still very much a work in progress. But we want to show you what we found to date and some of the the issues that we run across. We show we have a lot of photographs to go through, and, and also to show you the structure of this document. And so, what you'll be expecting in in the final document, and and you'll see pieces and parts of all of it as we go through today. All right. And, and this is basically, uh, when we do a historic structure report, this is the primary structure of it. The beginning will be an introduction and, and an executive summary, which we, we don't have to show you today. We basically do that part last so that we have all the information and we'll put that together. But the idea is that you could pull that part out and have a synopsis of, of what, we have, what we're recommending and what we have found. And then and basically it's a look at the existing conditions of the building. We break that into different elements. And then within each of these elements, there's a further breakdown. And But here it's basically the site and then the tower and steeple, which is obviously such a major part of this, and uh, the brickwork in general, and um, also getting into the basement and crawl space. And, and each of those categories, we're looking at sanctuary as well, looking at the historic sanctuary building and, uh, and a big of course, a big look at the tower and steeple area. And then we'll, we have a prioritized phasing list. We have a draft of that we'll go over with you today, but it's still kind of evolving. And uh, we don't have cost estimates yet. We'll do that once we have our scope further defined, but we'll have that with us at the next meeting. But I think, Craig, you want to dive in and I may jump in and out. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh... Looking at the uh, report, like Columbus said, we started, we we're here in January. I met with Mark Watson out here. He gave me the lowdown on what he has found in the past and some of his work kind of led me through. We were up on the lift in the crawl space, uh, up on the roof, um, in the tower. So I got a really good tour from Mark, who was real familiar with it from previous work as well. So that was very helpful on this end for us. Uh, what I've done in the in the presentation here is, and you'll see on the conditions and recommendations, we'll get into this, and this will be a long descriptive with both the findings and then recommendations. And then I'm going to introduce into the slide presentation. It won't be part of the report, but you'll see some just bullet points I'm going to hit because I don't need to read the whole report for you. But in the bullet points, I'm just going to hit the highlights of what I found for those particular elements. So that's how we laid it out. So with grading and drainage, we're walking around again today looking at some elements out there on the grading and drainage. Um, there are uh, downspouts that are dumping on the ground, a lot of area drains. Uh, rising damp uh, is oftentimes an issue where water gets dumped on the side of the building, whether it be overflowing gutters, downspouts, dumping, whatever the case might be, getting into solid masonry walls, working its way up called rising damp and then working its way into the building, causing plaster blistering and, and finish damage to the interior of the building. There's various examples of uh, staining, which sometimes is often a sign of it. Um, the downspouts, how they dump and drain, the, the positive sloping away from the building. So those types of things we'll be exploring a little bit more and coming up with uh, some recommendations uh, to further what has already been we done. some questions about where some of the underground drainage goes and, and what y'all know about that so that we can be thinking about how things might connect. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask if there's anybody here who has that all up here. We being just the ones we have up there, he would be happy to, uh, I can put you in touch with him. I okay. might already have his contact info, but he would be, he and Joel Little would be the best sources for that. Mm -hmm. And then the courtyard, I kind of want to come back to that. We looked at the courtyard. It's been mentioned in the past. We kind of want to get a better sense from you all as far as what needs to happen there as far as development, landscaping, um, uh, the drainage of it, where the water's going, how we want to deal with it, look at it when it's really raining out, what the problems are, and see how we can resolve that. There's one area where we need to kind of know where the drain lines are since it kind of got courtyarded. Do they, they go into the building somewhere and it'd be nice to kind of know where those go and how they work, if they're cleaned out, whatever the case might be. So um, that is one area that we'd like to talk with you all a little bit more about the development of that. The 
first area that we really wanted to look at, looking now turning to the tower and to the steeple, is the steeple roof. Uh, the steeple roof, in overall, is really in pretty good shape. It's um, it's definitely higher, but it is very restorable. And um, we've researched and we've looked at several examples. There are things we can do to that um, tin roof that are up there, the tin tile shingles that are up there um, to bring those back to a restorable condition. Um, it would be a shame to lose those tiles on that roof and to put all new tiles up there. There is rust, there's some damaged tiles, there's some uh, replaced ones, whatever the case might be, but it's definitely restorable. Um, and the other part of that too, which are in conjunction with the tile uh, roof up there with the tin is the are the uh, louvers up there. The outside of the louvers are in extremely poor condition. The wood's deteriorated. My knife could go right through the wood. They need to be the surrounds need to be rebuilt. Um, the fins themselves look like they're in good shape, but it's the surrounding components that have just taken a beating over the years and really need to be rebuilt. Um, the other thing while we're doing that, uh, just looking at the roof of the tower and looking at the louvers, it'd be an opportunity to provide from the inside a removable panel on a louver to be able to just take it off from the inside, slide it over and get out onto that tower roof so we don't have to get a lift and whatever the case might be. So with hardware clips, I don't think we can do hinges because of the steeple on the room we have up there, but a removable louver would serve as a, a maintenance access up there and I think serve well because if you don't have access, it doesn't get maintained. If it doesn't get maintained, it wears and then you end up with bad conditions with leaves and deterioration that goes undetected for years. So uh, we saw that opportunity. And then of course, coming back in with uh, new stainless steel, probably painted, painted black uh, insect screen on the inside, just so it doesn't stand out as a shiny, shiny uh, screen from the backside on the, uh, from below. And here are just some of the conditions that we found up there. Um, as you can see, the fins are really in not too bad of shape. There is some rust, there's some peeling paint. Uh, all of that is uh, restorable. Um, I've sent it to a, a reputable uh, company that actually does this type of work. And she immediately said, very doable without a hesitation on. So that was comforting to know uh, from her standpoint, somebody that really does this type of work every day. Uh, does need a coding system and it, it has had coding systems in the past but it'll be about removing things that are loose and getting back down to the good metal and there'll be some patching there'll be some replacement tiles we haven't been able to find an exactly matching tile yet but we found we think we found which company made this one they're just not around anymore but we found one that is is similar that we think will work well and uh, but we're still looking, we may find one even closer. So, here's the louver, of course, uh, just some of the conditions of the base of the louvers. These pictures are not of your building, but these are pictures from the uh, there's a Acromax is a company that does this type of coating recommended. They've done famous lighthouse in Maryland that's out in the water in the ocean and all types of things. And this is recommended by the lady I spoke with, the consultant about that as well and so this is the product she led me to so here's a before and an after it doesn't all come in white it can come in any color you want so that it won't be turned bright stark white we could get it down and matching pretty well here's the company the acromac um when i got on the phone with that lady while i was talking to her i sent her a picture of the uh tiles we had and she goes oh yeah that's uh national sheet metal roofing it looks like a national sheet metal roofing tile she said they're no longer around anymore uh, she sent me a link here. Uh, this is from the Wheeling Corrugating Company, and this one's getting pretty close to what we have here, but not quite. So that's going to be the goal is to get close, unless we go to some kind of a custom stamp. But if we're going to paint it and restore it, I think it'll blend with a few that we might have to restore. So uh, that was very encouraging. Here's that white house I was talking about you may have seen. So that product is very appropriate for this type of an application. So that's the steeple roof. Moving down to the tower roof. Now, there's lots of things going on there with the tower roof. Uh, the main thing, of course, is moisture intrusion, water intrusion, trying to figure out what's going on there. Um, like I said, that's the part of the report. Here's my bullet points, the findings. 
Um, the tower roof is probably seen and what we observed during our um, inspection is in poor condition. There's been several types of roofs and patches and materials used up there. Um, some of the flashing is there was standing water up there when I was there. Um, and just the terminations and the different materials up there. Uh, the crenellation caps, there's a lot of brick that's up there that's broken and uh, um, needs to be addressed, leaving a lot of these things then add up to just basically points of moisture intrusion, getting into the building, getting in the walls, in a solid masonry wall, that moisture over time then will deteriorate the mortar. And we see that then at the horizontal band up there that slopes to the mortar, the area just below that, and I have some pictures here, where the mortar is starting to just deteriorate and basically turn to powder on there from that constant water getting in there and trickling down through the walls. So um, that is one thing that really needs to be addressed up there. Um, some of the recommendations going back and I'm still throwing around the idea whether a membrane type roof up there would be appropriate or they make some really good now um, liquid fluid applied type roofing materials with all the ins and outs and the crenellations and things going on there. There's a lot of corners. And so once you introduce mechanical flashings and membranes, just like what's going on there now, you got a lot of room for air and a lot of joints and crevices that can fail over time. These liquids basically become a big solid membrane that gets rolled on and reinforced with mesh. So I'm really looking at that option as a recommendation to do the fluid applied uh, roof up on the tower there based on what I saw. Um, good products that have long warranties uh, uh, with the fluid applied. That wasn't the case 10 years ago or so, but there are some now that you can get a 20-year warranty on it. Um, it's basically like you're pouring a swimming pool on it. And I'm going uh, to I'm going to hit these last couple things on here, and then I'll go back up with the pictures um, about the crenellations. One opportunity, I noticed there are some light fixtures up there, some wire hanging out up there. We're doing all this stuff. We might go back and we see it all the time with Christmas twinkly lights and things that have just gone by the wayside in the attic spaces or boxes all over the place of uh, light bulb boxes and things from over the years. Our church has that in the attic. Everything just loaded up with those. But this would be an opportunity to come back and really light that steeple up and make it really glorious with new lighting and be able to rough it in where it's tied in and sealed as part of the, the design and the restoration of the steeple and the tower. And likewise, um, consideration of a possible lightning protection system. That's another thing that we're seeing a lot on the courthouses. I don't, if that's an area of contention led based on that, I don't know, but. We've had a couple of big lightning strikes in the last two years that have taken out a lot of AV equipment twice. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've done a little work to lightning protect, but that tower is still a big conductor. Yeah, um, clearly. And so, and, and it looks like it had lightning protection at one time, but it doesn't connect anymore. <laughs> so it just, we always, we can always, if, if we get into the design phase and so forth, we can put that as an alternate. We can identify a cost to it, depending <laughs> on what it is. We can break it out in a bid and you can take it or leave it or do it later. At least you know a rough number of what it is. They don't seem as expensive as I thought they were. We just put one on the courthouse in Marshall County up in Holly Spring. Um, we put a couple of them on some of the lodges we're doing. So um, there seems like we're doing more and more of these lightning protection system will face just like you said, with all the electronics, people are just worried about blowing things up. So uh, but, yes. Uh, the tower roof plan, I'm almost to the pictures. Uh, just a small little thing, all of the crenellations around here, as you can see, and I was surprised even seeing it in this point of view, how many ins and outs, nooks, corners, and all that are, are there where we're trying to seal up in a very small area between, say, the steeple tower and that parapet wall crenellation. It's very tight, so um, that's the challenge we have here is to get water to that one point down right now to a one-point scupper and collector head. Um, and that's the area of the worst deterioration and rot and so forth in the tower underneath as well, um, as you may have heard before. So the idea is to get everything to drain and also create an overflow situation. So if that one doesn't drain for whatever reason, a tennis ball or a soccer ball or something gets plugged up in there, where's that water going to go? It's going to go anywhere except sit on that roof. So that's the other thing is to create an overflow. Right now, that one scupper where all the water goes to, that downspout comes down and just empties on top of the roof area between the sanctuary and the tower. 
because some of the moisture you see underneath, every time, you know, every bit of water you're getting that runs down that steeple or whatever is emptying out in sort of your most susceptible location. It's where a lot of flashings come together. And so that's something we're looking at is how to take that, you know, pipe it off the roof and get it down to the ground so it's not left to just run out over, over where all those connections are. So just a series of pictures here of up on the roof. Um, here's that horizontal band I was talking about. It has a good created slope, which the intent was great, and it's just worn over the years. That's supposed to be sloping. You can see you got a green roof up there. Uh, you got some cracks. You got a lot of open, vulnerable joints there. And just below that tower then are where the, uh, the powdered motor and those types of things are from the inside of the tower. A lot of these pictures are just kind of to show the parts and pieces, the different types of roofing over there. And I was going to say, I don't want to meet the squirrel that you guys have that live in here, <laughs> but I think I met it the last time we were up there with Mark because we looked up there and Mark goes, there he is, for crying out loud, right there. So, but that right there is chewed metal on there from probably the squirrel going through 24 gauge metal. Okay. And those teeth, and you can see the teeth mark in there of that metal that just deteriorated, just Damage that thing. I was amazed. So, like I said, I'm glad I didn't come across it. We do come across squirrels very closely a lot of times in towers, but this one was way up on the top when we were in there, thank goodness. So, lots of squirrels in the attic with me on the Yep. <laughs> so, um, and I got to, uh, let's see. Just some more pieces here. You can see the standing water when I was there right in front of the scupper. That water's supposed to go in there. It's not going. So it sits up there, all those joints, and then it just works its way down and starts tearing things up below it. Here's some of the old lighting. So I think it would be an opportune time to come back and at least introduce the rough in and the stanchions for the lights, whether or not you put the lights in, but at least we can get integral with the design of the system. Uh, the crenellation caps, I wanted to kind of mention that. The, uh, that's a new term to me, by the way, of uh, looking up castles and crenellations mm -hmm. and so forth. It was really kind of cool. Um, but a lot of those are really deteriorated. You can see they've stalled, they've broken off, they've worn. And in the past, they've had an asphalt coating putting over the top, which a lot of places now has failed and worn and tired. Um, my recommendation there would be come back. I don't want to put copper on there. Copper is going to stain it. If it once it wear, it starts to patina and come down and turn your brick green. Um, I'm looking at possibly putting a, a thin sheet of lead over there, a parapet cap type through wall flashing down on top of that, removing all this, fixing the bricks, putting a small piece or thin piece of lead flashing over the top, and then coming back with a thin piece of cast stone um, cap or on the top of it that slopes back towards into the tower area to provide that level of protection. So you don't have all the joints of the brick and open and to protect that a little bit. It's still masonry. You can put a water repellent on there and the new cast stone, it'll last a whole lot longer than some of these crenellations that are starting to break up and get um, deteriorated. We also want to, we want to direct that water back inward because we don't want to direct very much water over the edge because then you get staining over time and that becomes something that is an issue. But if we can direct it back inward and collect it, in that roof area and bring it down, we'll be better off the long run. And here is uh, what Belinda was talking about. Here's the downspout coming down from that single collector head. It's coming down, it's basically emptying right onto that flashing there at a vulnerable spot of the roof in that valley between the main sanctuary roof and the tower, the cricket there that's built up out of copper. So any splash or head coming, head fire coming down, that downspout's gonna splash up under that wall, get behind the flashing, get into the joints, get up behind those shingles, whatever the case might be. So there is some uh, plaster damage or plaster blistering down in that area inside uh, that I noticed the last time. This is the rotted uh, wooden deterioration underneath that scupper up here from the underside. So it's hard to get a good shot of underneath there and it starts to all kind of look the same up there, but that's the area underneath that. This beam here, there was absolutely nothing left. It's basically just a skeleton of a beam with the inside of it taken out, just rotted and deteriorated, whether it be termites or just deterioration. So uh, we'll talk about the structure in a bit. I just put this picture in here. That's taken from one of Mark's previous reports back in 2018, where there's, a looks like a newer membrane type asphalt roof with the uh, scupper with no 
squirrel bites or anything like that. So that's happened within the last uh, five years, it looks like. Um, rolling that right into the masonry, this is the tower and the steeple, but it somewhat relates to the whole building too. So we'll probably expand that uh, with our report. Here's the report sheet and then hit some of the high points here. Um, as you notice, the brick is very soft. It's a very weathered brick uh, laid in the running bond. We notice today, as like you said, you notice something every day, some places between the windows or wherever it might be, all of a sudden it almost looks like they ran out of brick and they started putting little tiny pieces of brick in there somehow, which to me adds character. You just wonder what the thought was behind that. So, so that's kind of a neat little, neat little thing there, I thought. Um, I'm calling them rough mortar joints. They're they're not real straight clean, which gives it a lot of character. It's kind of they're broken edged kind of mortar joints, I guess you could say, but not the clean ones you'd see on the newer buildings. So that is one thing that will drive how much repointing we're going to recommend to the building. Because if you start repointing some of the soft brick and trying to get that out, um, there's a good chance of damaging the brick even more, breaking off the edges of that brick when you go to remove that mortar. Now, where we have very obvious newer Portland cement um, areas that have spalled and caused damage already, we'll want to go in and repoint those areas. Mm -hmm. But I'm not to the point yet where I'm going to say 100% repointing on the building. I, I just don't think that that's going to be the right thing to do for this particular one, especially after looking a little bit even more today around the building. So um, we did notice a little bit of bulging. There's a on the west face just below that band that I was talking about, that slope band. There's a little bit of a bulging going on there, probably due to the interior uh, whites of brick and the powdering and the deteriorating mortar inside, causing that brick to be pushed outward a little bit. So we'll recommend taking maybe some of those bricks off on the outer white to get a good sense of what's going on, how far back, <clears throat> and maybe end up rebuilding that one small section of brick where it's starting to bulge back to the original detail. We've had to do that before and we found the inner whites. It doesn't do any good to tie your brick on the outside back to something that's just powder. You have to get that stuff on the inside stable and then we can use ties or whatever the case might to, to hold that and stabilize the face of the brick. Uh, I talked a little bit about the parge coating on the buttresses. I do have some more sections down later in general sections about that as well. Uh, the brick in general, especially the horizontal edges, which is very typical, the ledges around the windows, whatever the case might be, there's a lot of biological staining. Um, we always recommend, of course, the gentlest means possible. We don't go in there with pressure washer and start blowing the thing uh, clean, um, especially with the softer brick. There's a lot of really good biological cleaners out there you put on them, and then they continue to actually clean over the years. One product's called D2, and we found that fairly su uh, successful on these types of stains. So uh, that would be something we definitely look at recommending and probably testing before we went in and really did the whole building on something like that. And then here's just some of the pictures and conditions. Uh, you can see where the Portland cement was installed there in later years. And because of the hardness of it, the thickness of the brick, it forces and it spalls out that brick, causing brick faces to pop. Once the brick faces pop, it leaves it open to the weather to start deteriorating a little bit more. Um, there's pockets of those areas around the building that we've seen. And um, rather than we establish a depth basically of that spall falling brick to determine how much of that we would actually replace or treat. We can do a consult what they call consolidation, consolidation on the brick, which is a uh, chemical you put on there that will um, harden and the, the surface to try and give it a little bit more weather life on it than just leaving it open to the inner parts of the brick. We've had to do that after a fire in a building where it got really susceptible to the hot and it it kind of affected the face of the brick. So we came in and applied the consolidant on it to, to, to try and harden a little bit rather than removing the whole brick. Now, if it's really bad, we'll want to remove it, replace it. If we can find a brick from around the building in the crawl space or somewhere that we might be able to seal, we can put that in there and replace the one down below where it's visible so we aren't having these bricks that stick out all over the building. So we always try and salvage from the building itself to do that. There again, some of the horizontal ledges, a lot of them are ready, which is good. They have the, the mortar cans on there to shed the water away. Uh, we always recommend that if you don't want any water sitting on any kind of a horizontal ledge. 
uh, over time. This is that area of bulging on the west side there. You can kind of see it in the picture there. It's hard to get a perspective unless you're looking straight up at it or from the lift down the wall on it, but it is sticking out a little bit there is what we're looking at. Like the uh, round window, for example, that is in your sanctuary, you know, there's a there's also mortar that's around the bottom side of that. And, uh, and when they were up in the lift, you could see that some of that is breaking up. So some of the moisture that's getting in that wall is probably coming in from the bottom of that ground. What's window. behind so the brick? It needs right some work. Hmm? Where it's bulging out, what's behind the brick? Just more brick with not a whole lot of mortar on the inside of it. And I got a few pictures of that when we get, I believe, coming down the way here. Um, yeah, this is on the inside of that where you see a lot of the voids of the mortar here. Uh, all of these pictures like that, it's kind of hard to get up at the little pocket there and the joist system there, but there's a lot of voids in the mortar there. And if you if you go down uh, here, you can start to see the powdered mortar just piling up on the top of this piece of wood right here. So this is another one inside of there. How old is are these bricks roughly? I mean, do you know? How old are the bricks? Yeah, I mean, I'm just thinking how long have they lasted? The staple, from my understanding, was put in 18... Mm -hmm. 1870. And then the, so, and of course the church was earlier than that, is 51, 50, 59, 59 is what I remember from somewhere. And so, I mean, they've lasted a long time. They've just taken a, taken a lot of weather and over the years, the soft brick. Um, I don't know, in one of the reports is mentioned it may have been sandblasted at one time which is not a good idea on brick because it just destroys that front protective coating of a brick that's been fired hard. So I don't know if that's happened over the years or not, but um, it is a very worn soft. Regardless, it has a lot of weathering on the face of the brick and um, probably will need a periodic coating. There's some Clear coatings that are breathable. It's very important to put breathable coatings on brick because there's inevitably moisture that gets into the wall and you always want that to be able to dry out. But there are some permeable coatings that can go on that will help, help improve that weatherability of it. And uh, they just don't last forever in our sun. So there's that'll be something we'll look at with sort of a schedule of a, we think you should probably do this every so many years or whatever. Those are good. Those are good. What is the reason they would sand plant? Just to clean it. They, no. probably, they probably didn't have pressure washers back there. It's an easy way to clean it. They probably got up there. There's no tailing. They might want like to. Back in the 70s and 80s, that was a really popular thing to do. Like the church at Rodney, Mississippi, that you see in photos a lot, it got sandblasted like in the late 70s. And it was just a way to clean it up. And uh, but unfortunately, it you know it really did a number on the brick and they sandblasted the wood trim there as well. And mm -hmm. it's like the soft part of the wood. You know, if you go down and look at the ridges and the wood around the windows and around the doors, because they sandblasted out the soft part of the wood. And nowadays, I mean, we don't typically do sandblasting, but if you got some really harsh things in certain instances, like metals or whatever it might be, they sandblast with walnut, brown, broken up walnut shells or ice pellets or whatever it so, might be, little silica type beads. So it's a little, not quite as harsh as sandblasting, but we still don't recommend that unless it's metal or something that's really, uh, that's the only way to, to do it and we don't do it much. Um, this is a picture of the inside of the tower has been parge coated as well. Uh, plastered, parge coated, a little bit of both, but it is also just because of the moisture starting to, to fall off and peel off. <coughs> Uh, the structural, um, when Mark was out here, I had him just kind of basically give me a five-year update evaluation based on his last report of 2018. Everything he said, there's really no measurable changes to anything there that has been done. The structural reinforcement, the steel, of course, is still there. Um, the temporary uh, supports are in there. Uh, some of the wood framing members. We still have the mortar damage. We still recommend taking that structural 
steel framing and bringing it up on more level to help support and stabilize the steeple on the tower as well. So uh, we looked at ways when we were up there to just basically extend those tube seals that are in there up to the next level to try and provide a little bit of additional support. So that's his, that's his updated report. Um, as I mentioned, we did have, there are areas up there with the uh, wood members that are severely damaged. Uh, that need to be removed and replaced. Uh, some of that was taken care of with some of the, the, the things that were done previously in the where uh, support may have been um, compromised. Uh, of course, it's been mentioned this, the spire and the steeple is, is leaning, but we're probably not gonna push it back with it. We're gonna stabilize it so it doesn't go all the way. So that was the idea, but that it was interesting. Have you gotten back far enough? But yes, is what they're alluding to is probably going to that southeast corner where the drain is, where all the support was going. So that's when it's been kind of alluded to in some of the reports. And I've read it a couple times where the the spire is leaning, but it's kind of you stabilize it, and it's just that's character. From some of the earlier photos, that lean has been there a long time. Long time. It should be. about all that and here's some of the damage here's one of the woods i was talking about that's basically <laughs> underneath the uh that's that uh, roof drain is right above this this is a little bit clearer shot this is one of the beams i was talking about basically you got the frame on the outside of the beam and there's nothing left on the inside of it so that'd be along the south wall there um, this is another shot up in that area um, just some of the old, uh, the new steel that's been extended up, some of the uh, steel reinforcements that have been in place over the years during that uh, reinforcement stage, um, which that cross bracing, just some examples. There's some parallel beams up there that were used, box beams to support um, transfer beams. This is going across, and then you can see another member coming across the top of that. So thing. Things were taken care of to try and prevent it from leaning and to stabilize it back when, but we need to go in and extend that steel up and, and do a more permanent type of situation <laughs> into it. Uh, the steeple tower itself, um, it looks great. Mark said over and over that everything on the inside there, we didn't see any signs of water staining, no. uh, any moisture, any damage. The decking on there was uh, beautiful. I mean, it's a really neat, cool structure up into that area. Some of the pictures he had is looking both up like this. This is one of his, and then looking down, um, where it's just the, the craftsmanship and the and it's held well over the years, even based on the condition of the the tile or the the tin shingles on the outside of it. So um, that was very encouraging. Uh, some of the drainage things we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, some of the vulnerable spots, this is the one coming down from the tower hitting there that we want to look at the flashing, see if we can just take and really just run the, the, the downspout down around the corner and not let it hit in a vulnerable spot. Um, this is where the tower hits the, uh, the roof along the west side. Uh, and really water comes down here. It was raining one day. I don't think I caught it here, but there was just water dripping off of there. But going into those pockets, introducing moisture into those walls with a really heavy uh, head of water coming down there. Um, that's a really saturated, vulnerable area. Um, this one's right outside the door where the downspout comes and really kind of comes down and gets caught by this uh, this area drain, it appears to be. But we really want to try and take some of these areas down to the ground and into a system to divert it away from the building rather than on the building. Same thing with this. This goes into the gutter, but I find if we have gutters that are filled up, then we, then all of a sudden that starts backing up into the building. So it's those types of things that we really make note of and make you aware of that things we see over time from clogged gutters, diverted water, whatever it case might be. So uh, a lot of a lot has been said and looked at as far as the parts coating on the uh, buttresses around the church. Um, it's deteriorated in various degrees, but most of it's severe, leaving a lot of exposed brick uh, from the structure below. Um, there's been, and we have the reports from the uh, analysis that were done, both from the uh, 
the exterior coating, and then there's actually another, almost a pink or in co inside coating. We have those reports that we can use then to try and simulate and come back with a coating to go back over the top with uh, a bonding agent or whatever the case might be. But um, just by going and you, you tapping on some of these surfaces, there's a lot of delaminated um, coatings on the buttresses that will need to be removed back to solid, stable material, cleaned, um, likely a bonding agent. And then there's a lot of different products, restoration products for stone and masonry that we can come back over that with a similar mix, uh, likely that was used previously with various conditions. The basement and the crawl space. Um, when I was down there, it was dry, smelled dry, felt dry, whatever the case. First time you go into a building in a basement, if it smells damp and musty, you're going to start seeing signs. When I walked down there, there was nothing. There's a little bit of standing water and sump pump. That's normal. Um, the crawl space, of course, had a uh, a really good vapor barrier set in it. Um, it's been mentioned in previous reports and we noticed it as well. Some of the deterioration of the mortar that may have been over time previously or just slow deterioration. This is also powdered. It went up about three and a half feet so we can come back over time. I don't believe that it's a critical phase item at this point to do that. I wanna take care of all the moisture stuff before we move to the basement. But I did wanna just mention that um, I was happy to see things really dry down there. That's usually not the case in a basement uh, where you have some of these other issues going on. The plaster, uh, interior plaster, some of these areas. This is below the tower. A little bit hard to see in the pictures here. We'll try and get enhance that a little bit. But there is some blistering in these areas that I've circled that I've noticed around the sanctuary. Um, and in the tower area where water has worked its way through the masonry walls, whether it's a connection from a building or another structure, a roof, uh, in this case, like I said, that's right underneath that scupper area there. These are, these are up in the tower area. Um, you can, there is blistering up here, likely just those horizontal ledges and some of those open joints. Mortar joints themselves, brick themselves are, are water penetrable. So water does get into brick, especially with softer brick, softer mortar, water gets in. You got to let it breathe out and you got to let it breathe in. So that's why Belinda was saying it's so critical to let your masonry breathe. The worst thing you can do on there is put a non breathable coating on there. It's going to make water go where you don't want it to really go. So um, I've seen some really bad examples of that where they went on the outside and they put what looked like a glazed donut coating on the exterior of a brick. It was graffiti control and it was just a solid shining sheen of brick up about 10 feet. It was terrible. And then uh, as Belinda mentioned, the uh, prioritized phasing, this is a real critical one that we look at the whole scope uh, of the project, our findings, and then we try and come up with a, basically a plan of attack for y'all to recommend. Um, uh, our focus is normally on moisture control, trying to figure out where water is coming from, how to control it, how to stop it. You can't do anything on the inside. You can't really do anything structurally. You got to control that moisture. So that's why we come in here and we come into the shingle roof. We come into the louvers while we're up there. And I'm also looking at sequence for construction. If you're going to have somebody up there with scaffolding up the whole tower, you need to take care of that stuff. Otherwise, you're paying a whole lot more to do it two or three times with lifts. If you can combine and mobilize and consolidate that work into one package, um, and a lot of times those restoration folks are sometimes one and the same who's going to do that work. So to mobilize and to do all that work in one package is really beneficial. So we take that into account with this as well. So with that said, looking at this, the, the steeple shingle, uh, the top 10 shingles, uh, the louver restorations, um, replacing and uh, repairing the uh, roof deck and all of the roofing up on the top of the tower, address the roof drainage issues to try and get that stuff away from the building uh, and down into the ground into an uh, underground drainage system. Um, stopping the moisture, taking care of all those uh, water intrusion points into the parge coating. 
Um, and then while we have everybody in the tower, we'll want to go ahead and go take care of repointing. If we have to tie brick back into it or those bulging areas, whatever the case might be, we need a stable inside to be able to address and tie back the outside. Uh, and then again, if we're going to be up there and doing all this work to, to consider possibly as an alternate, the, the lighting and a, a lightning protection system. Coming in under that, um, that's where, at least at this point, and like Wanda said, we're still looking at all of these parts and pieces. Um, <laughs> but right now we had just looking at the uh, extension of the internal steel frame, uh, making some of these wood repairs up in here. Some of that's going to happen with up here with the roof framing and decking, depending <laughs> on where it goes within the tower. Um, mm -hmm. And then there'll be some plaster and parge coating on the interior of the tower as well once we get some of that work underway. Um, some of the, the lower priority things are looking, well, I say lower, the underground drainage, some of these things, they're all going to kind of mix. But looking at the underground drainage, how we get water from the roof down into the ground and away from the building, some of that will be tied in with the underground drainage. Uh, once we learn a little bit more about that and how it's running and where the lines are, what we need to do with that, uh, addressing the rising damp issues and then any landscaping improvements. Uh, and then coming back, once we get the moisture control, we get the structural things taken care of, uh, we get the, the wood replaced and the parge coatings, the big moisture intrusion apartments uh, components taken care of, then we can come back and start repairing some of that plaster inside. Otherwise, it's just going to keep coming back. Uh, somewhere along the line, a lot of times if there's a lot of moisture in the wall, we like to open that plaster up, take off all the loose plaster in the damaged areas, just let that wall breathe for a little while, let it all come back, and then come back with the bonding agent and putting that plaster back in um, when you know you have it good and dry once you can take your moisture content and reinstall the plaster and finish it out at that point. And then when we come back next time to your meeting, uh, we'll take all that into account, the phasing the components, and then we'll line item each of the different phases um, and put an associated cost with that so we can come up with a grand total. We want to give you each phase total cost, um, and we don't want to just give you the total construction cost. We'll give you the fees, any estimated testing expenses. We always, especially in restoration projects, include a contingency. And a lot of people really want to end up knowing what the total estimated project cost is, not just the total construction cost is. That way you get a really true number. And that was just phase one I broke out to kind of show you how we're going to structure that or at this point structure that where we would give you that for each of the phases for you to take into account, including the uh, all, any alternates we might recommend. So you can get a cost and have a line item on that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? I have one that is kind of unrelated to that. The every time we go and pull on the bell, I'm just because you can't see it. I'm just like, is that really safe? So we have all that going on up there. Is it? Have, did y'all think you could look at that? I wanted to ring it down. <laughs> well, it's broken right now. Or we did. Uh, we're, I was at a. Oh, I was at the courthouse. We were looking at after the tornado, we were looking at the courthouse and we we're up there. And one of the guys we were with, he just all of a sudden went ding, and somebody said, oh. <laughs> Apparently, he wasn't supposed to do that. Uh oh. <laughs> but he couldn't resist. Yeah. So, um, does all that look good? And I mean, we do look at the structural of the bell stuff up yeah. there because it is a heavy component. I had a really cool picture of the bell, which I didn't include here, but I wanted to just because it was a really cool picture. Of 1860, I think, is in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. where the bell That's crazy. Yeah. So it, it, it's always neat to see the relationships of the different bells in the courthouses. And just mm -hmm. science. So it's but, in a really substantial structure. It is. Okay. It's in kind of a post and beam sort of frame, mm -hmm. and then that's supported by the interior structure. Normally, like she said, they're on a heavy timber. We've gone back in the past where there are some questionable things if there's any slight deterioration there, but a lot of times we um can go in there and put say a w acre just a, a well sorry that's a, just a steel beam underneath there to just reinforce it if there's any questionable or movement or deflection that we notice so that would be certainly something we explore when we go back um in detail and look at those types of details of what structure specifically we have to go back in there and repair we know we have 
some, but the steel and also the wood structures to go back and replace and reinforce. Some of it might not be complete replacement, it'll just be reinforcement with repair lines, like you said there, that we've gone past. I have a question. I don't really know how to ask it, but it seems like, you know, we've done like hit and misses over the years. Not when I'm, you know, I, I'm speaking naively. I don't really know that. But I know you talked about like coatings and roofing and like the roofing material could last 20 years or whatever. Is there a company or companies that provide these services like they come in every year and check this so that we don't end up in five years back in the same spot or you know what can we do that we aren't in this spot because i mean this building is what it is i mean we're going to be dealing with this forever so um i mean are there contracts or there companies or the guarantees what is there Roofing contractor, some of them do have maintenance type things, but a lot of it is just really developing. And I don't know if you already have a maintenance plan for the church. Some churches have maintenance plans where you check things monthly, biannually, cleaning gutters, whatever. We need That's that. one thing you need to do. What's that? That's what we need. Yeah. And, and I say gutters because I, it's even at our church, when we have a work day, it's the first thing I do. I take a blower up and I walk down the thing and I blow out the gutters on on the walkway because it just it's it just creates a lot of issues and over the years it starts to introduce water into the building and where you don't want it but with something like that and that's why i was saying even on the uh, um providing some kind of an access easy i say easy climbing up inside of the steeple and getting out easily or to the roof to be able to inspect it without having to get a lift or whatever it is, right. to be able to get out of a lure and look at it, look at the condition, see if it's been damaged, see if the squirrel's eaten it. I've seen membrane roofs eaten by squirrels. I've seen metal eaten by squirrels, but be able to get up there every six months or every year and just really inspect it. That's if there's right. an issue there, you got warranties going on from damage. Well, I mean, it's always questionable on warranty things, but at least you would be able to get up and inspect it and watch it and, and address it appropriately. Um, the coatings that that's really up. I want to say up and coming. Um, I've been hesitant in the past to use them, but now I'm learning a lot more about them and they've become a lot better. The first ones out there, I didn't like. Now <laughs> they're becoming reinforced. They're a lot better. There's better warranties on them and they really have their place for something like this with all the nooks and crannies and the pieces and trying to metal flash all of those things can be a nightmare. And you're just asking for points of water intrusion. So the coatings is somewhat what I'm leaning on. And uh, with the reinforcement, they do last a lot longer than what they used to. And so um, there are companies, I believe, I haven't dealt with a maintenance company or a, a maintenance package, like you would almost like with an elevator. With an elevator, you can get a maintenance package contract. You know, like fix it up and then the issues still be there. Yeah, right. Right. It happens again. Right. And it, like I said, it is what it is. So, I'll check on a warrant or like a, a maintenance inspection program that some of these roofing companies might offer. Well, that's, a, that's a good question. There are some roofing companies that you will know, contract with you for, you know, like an annual. Clean out everything, check everything, et cetera, et cetera, or every six months. Uh, I don't know if the ones around here do that. But we've had them in, in school projects over the years today, uh, just to try to make sure we knew no one was looking. So, uh, so there are options. I don't know of anyone that guarantees that kind of thing. Uh, it's more of someone coming in and you know and maintaining and informing and fixing and cleaning, but. I don't know of anyone that would say, you know, I'll guarantee that for 20 years from that standpoint. I'm just hoping <laughs> products get guaranteed. But. but I think a lot of it just has to do with keeping your eyes on it, too. Mm -hmm. Just having a maintenance program, that's a big thing that folks sometimes don't have. And, and things get neglected. And a simple little ding from a squirrel or a branch that might have hit it or whatever, all of a sudden can make it a big problem if it's not um, found early on. So it's just like mechanical systems. If you put one on the roof, you don't have access to it, it's never going to get maintained. So if you get good access, easy access to 
something, whether it's a good ladder or a stair or something, people are going to get up there, supposed to get up there easier later and more often to look at it and review it. So. Brenda, was there mention of our stained glass windows? Is that, did you look at those? Or? Not really. I know we have a copy of uh, where Pearl River Glass yeah. had looked at changing out the coverings on them, and that's a, that's our go-to okay. for folks. So you know, if, if you want to have an analysis done from a stain, basically from a conditional standpoint, mm -hmm. I would I would recommend getting them to kind of do that. What we're looking at is more about the window sill at the bottom right. of the window. Is that adequate and not letting water in or the edges and that kind of thing? brick around it so you don't mm -hmm. see kind of the water weather tighten so mm -hmm. there pearl river is the experts at that we see them in a lot of churches we've worked on so and that was worked into the estimate that they gave us um and i don't remember what that was i can recirculate it but mm -hmm. what they said mm -hmm. was, mm -hmm. I think there was a take the plastic Covering off the replacement glass. That's right. Yeah, and the mm -hmm. fixture sealant. But they said, let's do that at the end. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do that now. Yeah. And I think that didn't it include replacing the one window in the tower. Do you? Yeah. Right. I think they did. I'm not sure the cost did. I think it did one more time. Yeah. Yeah. Final question. Talk a lot about obviously moisture and Leakage and whatnot. Did you notice any mold growing from the from the interior? Because those areas that you circled that you said there was a lot of leakage. I know? just saw signs of just blistering, really. So now if I scraped underneath that, but um, I didn't see any mold or anything in there when I was here in January. So it was just blistering a lot of times. What we'll see. And where do we leave the courtyard in this analysis? I know you, you sort of left with that, but what are we doing? That's something we wanted to ask you about as far as what if there's been any talk about it from your standpoint, if there's been any big drainage issues. Um, like I said, it was just barely starting to rain when I left here in the dark the last time I was here in January. So I didn't get to see ponding or anything like that in there. Um, are there big issues in there that you're currently experiencing or are there plans to address anything in there that you've noticed over the, the few years here. Um, so I guess it was just a matter of defining a scope in there if you'd like us to look at anything in the court. Looks like there's six or eight small drains in there that take water away and like I said we don't know which way that can go out of the courtyard. Comes now to the to the east and connected to the main storm drain system that runs under this building now. Um, previously it was not connected. Um, so that's one thing we were able to do. So drainage is not as much of an issue now. Um, appearance is an issue. Mm -hmm. and of course, there are remains out there, so mm -hmm. it's a delicate process. The, the, thing, the thing that's new, maybe since the last time we talked, was we want to get ADA, ADA access from that um, south entrance. Is that right? Yeah, south entrance into the nave, mm -hmm. which might mean messing with the covered walkway that serves as the sort of west facade to that courtyard, maybe even eliminating it, mm -hmm. um, turning it into a co covered rather than encased walkway. Um, but we do want to we want to put a ramp into that south entrance. Um, so coming courtyards right out here. So coming up. Yeah, from the south. We can, it's probably a separate conversation. Okay. We have some money set aside specifically for that. Okay. Anything else? You've given us a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions, you can all just email us or whatever in the meantime, but we're going to continue on just developing, phasing it the best we can and best what we think would be the best for the church and coming up with our costs associated with it and uh, come back and present that to you. Thank you.